Well, our course is getting close to an end. We're going to be spending some time with Fresnel diffraction. Now, Fresnel diffraction is more complicated than Fraunhofer diffraction, so we're going to have three classes on Fresnel diffraction. Let's look at the course in general. When you talk about optics, light, you have reflection, refraction, diffraction, interference, polarization. And that's the main basis of our entire course. If you look at our course, we have emphasized reflection, even with rainbows, reflection, refraction going on inside of a raindrop. So reflection, refraction, diffraction, interference, polarization. Now we could add photons, the photoelectric effect, and we will the last day of class talk about that, but our course really is on geometric and physical optics. And the idea of the light as a quantum is really another area, but you have seen that. When you talk about chemistry and electrons drop from one orbit to another, shake off a photon. So uh, really you are familiar with the photon concept. And when you say the energy of a photon is the Planck constant times the frequency F, capital E is HF, uh, you've, you've seen this, or you will if you haven't uh, already. Modern physics will talk about that. They talk about that in chemistry. So that's the basis of our course, and we're spending now a considerable amount of time on diffraction. And when you have diffraction, the concept of interference is there. You know, we, we talked about that, how you have the baby waves, the wavelets, they start to interfere with each other when you're looking at light spreading out, going through an opening or with an obstacle. So it's gonna be Fresnel diffraction, uh, for some time and this is going to be bringing our course to a close soon because we're near the end of the semester and one interesting historical story is back in the 1800s when there was this competition in France for papers to be written on light Fresnel submitted one on the waves and one of the judges actually three of the judges of the five judges didn't believe in waves. They believed in particles. Light is a particle since Newton had pushed light as a particle. And Poisson, a brilliant you know, mathematician, physicist, Poisson, uh, he uh, used Fresnel's equations from the paper to show that behind a say, obstacle, you would find, you could find a point of light, a light. He says, this is a joke. I mean, if you have like something blocking light, you're not going to find a spot behind an obstacle. And one of the judges, Arago, uh, decided to set the experiment up. And he was able to observe the spot. The infamous spot, now called the Poisson spot, or the Arago spot, or the Fresnel spot, prove that light does act like a wave, and scientists began to take the wave model now quite seriously. And Young had just shown, uh, not too much earlier, in 1801 or so, he did experiment with the two slits, the famous two slits, and showed interference patterns. So you might say Young's experiment, the two slit experiment, and Fresnel's paper here, Fresnel's work, helped establish in modern times the wave theory of light, or that light is a wave. Physical optics, which is uh, much of our course. So let's go on with the show and check out Fresnel. Chapter U. Fresnel Diffraction Part 1 
Now for L diffraction, you can think of as being closer to the slit or the openings when compared to Fraunhofer. And the framework we want to develop is one that includes both. And that takes us to U1, the Fresnel Kirchhoff. You may have heard of Kirchhoff's laws and electricity and circuits. So we will look at a source here that's giving off waves hit it to an aperture. And here, let's go ahead and put a couple more in there like this. All right. Here we're gonna use the Huygens principle, Huygens Fresnel principle where each point along a wavefront emits a baby wave. And see, this is then the front of the future, say. And then over here, we have some kind of a screen like this. So you can just think of some kind of wall here that goes on and on, a large, a large wall here. So this is like the mama wave here, the mama wave going out from the source of light. And then think of the little baby waves going the rest of the way into the future. To generate the future, use the baby waves. Now the baby waves can't be uniform in all directions because they would then go too far into the shadow region. Now we know we're going to get a little bit of diffraction at the edge, but uh, you're not going to have light going way, way up there in the shadow region. So in the model, they came up with obliquity factor. Now watch this. You don't want the baby waves going backwards. You really want the crest going forward. So what this does, if the theta is zero, like you're in the forward direction like this for a baby wave. So you can think of, in fact, if you have a baby wave like this, just think of the forward direction and we'll pick, let's just pick the axis along here, it's easier. So in other words, you measure like theta from the horizontal. So if the theta is zero, then you get one plus one over two, you get one. Now look what happens if the theta is back in a backward direction, 180, like, like you're gonna go backwards, like. Like what about, what about going back the other way? Well, then you'd have one minus one over two is equal to zero. And this is an easy way. If you want to think of it as a model, it's an easy way to uh, temper the baby waves so that they are enhanced you know, in the forward direction into the future, you know, as they expand. Here's a picture from the book showing the angle theta and picking the middle baby wave or wavelet and thinking of the formula as applied to this wavelet right here. So you get maximum strength in the forward direction and less and less and zero in the backward direction. Now let's look at this diagram again. And 
and we'll consider, say, a wave there, waves here, coming from some source where the strength, say, E naught, and we're going to go here to this point. And then this is going to have, say, a baby wave going out. So let's call this R prime. And then to some point P on the screen, let's call this R. So we start off with describing the mother wave. So the mother wave, remember our solution to the wave equation in spherical coordinates. We got the spherical wave e to the i k r over r. So if we apply this twice, once for the mother wave and then once for the baby wave, we'll have a neat setup. So this is the mother wave, so we'll call this one, this uh, really meant to say r prime here. So I'll put a prime here and one there. Remember the inverse square law that if you take this and you find like the length of a complex number, then you square that, this will come out as an r squared, one of r squared. Now for the baby wave, we have a distance r away. We do the same thing e to the i k r over r and the wave gets weaker as it gets farther away so what we do here is we apply this wave onto the mother wave and we then have the product so at p we'll have the e naught e to the i k r prime over r prime e to the i k r over r this is a nice formulation but we're going to have to integrate over the aperture to get all of them so just put a little integral sign there and say aperture over the aperture so you, you add up all the effects, you know, of these R primes and R's, so like that. So that's a little complicated there because a lot of things are changing. Now, if we want to include the obliquity factor for the baby wave, then we have to throw that in there also. So E at p some integral over the aperture here and i'll put the e naught on the inside for now one plus cosine of theta over two the obliquity factor for the baby wave and then e to the i k prime k r prime over r prime e to the i k r over r dA. This is kind of like a master, a master equation. And we can think of this master equation as a simplified form of the fresnel kirchhoff diffraction equation. Now for Fraunhofer diffraction, this is so far away the angle spreads very, very small. So in front half for diffraction, let's go ahead and review that since we spent a whole week talking about Fraunhofer. So in the Fraunhofer, say, realm, we're looking at the cosine factor here, the obliquity factor. 
obliquity is going to be one for the small, for the angles, you know, being small. You're looking at the cosine being one, then one plus one over two is one. And also we considered uniform a uniform, a simple case passing through the aperture is a plane wave. So another thing with the Fraunhofer is the plane wave idea. So you're looking at an aperture and you're looking at waves here coming in as plane waves. And then when you're very, very far away out this way, plane waves again. So if that's the case at the source here, this part is going to be a constant. So we can pull that out. So then we have at the point P, let's say we pull out E to the I K R prime over R prime as a constant. And then we integrate over the aperture E naught E to the I K R and there's our spherical wave da and now you're looking at what we did earlier in fact we can go ahead and absorb that constant into e naught after all it is part of the mama wave coming in so when you do that we get the Fraunhofer equation that we used and spent a whole week studying this. So it's nice to see how this comes out of the super framework. That's the Fraunhofer equation. You might look at it as a Fraunhofer framework. And remember they named Fraunhofer diffraction after Fraunhofer because his contributions to uh, spectroscopy and light and optics in general, rather than him working at all the things named after him. They, they honor him by calling him, say, his diffraction, Fraunhofer diffraction. So you can think of the more general formula as this one here. That's the more general formula. And then if you go down to this one, you're doing the Fraunhofer approximation, and that's sometimes referred to as far field since the observation on the screen, the screen is very far away. This will not be the case with Fresnel diffraction. We will be close. So there you have the formulation. Here we have Fresnel and Kirchhoff. Fresnel and Kirchhoff here, civil engineer and physicist, Fresnel, we talked about him dying young. And here we have uh, Kirchhoff, physicist, known for the laws, like in electricity and magnetism, you're doing circuits if you have a junction like this. And you have like I1 current, and here I2 and I3. You can write I1 is equal to I2 plus I3. Or if you had set it up where all the currents were pointing in, you could just say I1 plus I2 plus I3 equals zero. In this case, say I1, I3, and I2, the currents, algebraic sum, giving you zero. Or you can say what comes in must go out. And then the voltage law, like if you have, say, a battery here, and then say you have uh, the light bulb and a resistor. You go across the battery, say V naught, and then you could, sub you could subtract the voltage across the bulb minus the voltage across the resistor and you're back to zero. Or you can think of the battery voltage 
is equal to the voltage across the ball plus the voltage across resistor. Nice. Sure cost laws from uh, circuits. Okay. U2. Wavefront and optical path. So let's consider a wavefront here. Origin, say, at point O. And we'll have a distance here and another distance over here on the axis. This is on the axis. Point P and, you know, point O. And we'll call this A, and we'll call this B. So if we go up to this point up here, and then drop a perpendicular down there, and let's consider this as a radius, and you would have a circle here if you swung all the way around. Here you have the source of the waves coming out. We'll call this R prime. Let's call this H prime. And here, say if you look at this distance here, there's an extra path say, compared to here to there, this has an extra path, optical path. Let's call that delta. Now here, the R, if you measure from here R, this, you know, this is B because that's the radius. But then R, to go from the point P, all the way to here would be delta plus B. So that delta, that's important. That delta is going to be our extra optical path compared to the reference. Like if you were simply going this way, like if there's a crest here, and then you got this optical path, the crest would be up here. So who knows what would be there? So it could be a crest or a trough or something in between. So let's drop another perpendicular here down, call that H. Then this little piece here, let's call that delta prime with the lowercase delta and this delta. For small angles, by the way, this R prime is equal to A also, since that's still the radius. For small angles, this delta, big delta, is going to equal the sum of these two, because this is going to not be so high up. So we'll make that approximation. This is going to be delta, little delta plus little delta. We'll put the prime on one of them, first one there. And then remember, you know, R is equal to big delta plus B. Now it's kind of fun to find these deltas if you're looking at the situation where you have this triangle like this, but then there's this like arc that's coming down like that, like part of a circle. And this is say delta, this is a delta. In this case, it's the delta prime that will be set of that. And over here, you, know, you have the same situation where you have something like this, and you come on down like that. And that's then the delta there. So this is the H prime, and this is the H. So if we look at this, you can say, well, this whole distance here, this is like your radius, that's your B. And then if you want to find this delta, you know, this is also B down here. It's just the radius is swinging down. So what we can say is that if you take this B and you subtract from this B this part, 
from the triangle. And that part from the triangle is the square root of b squared minus h squared. Using the Pythagorean theorem, I did because this part here, squared plus h squared, is going to be that b squared. So we'll take the b, the big distance, and subtract the leg here, the, the part of the triangle, which is b squared minus h squared square root. And that will give us the delta. So delta equals b minus b. And I'll write this by pulling the b out. So there's a 1 minus h squared over b squared. And this is a 1 half power square root. So if you pull the b squared out, it comes out as a b. Then you have a 1. And here you have an h squared over a b squared. Put the b back in, you get a b squared. b squared's cancel, and you get what you're supposed to get. So now with the small angles, in other words, close this down, because you were making the approximation this big delta is the sum of the small deltas, then when you do that, you can do the uh, Taylor series expansion. And this is going to be 1 minus 1 half h squared over b squared. We make this approximation. And now if you look at this, you have b minus a b and then a plus. One of the b's are going to cancel. This is 1 half h squared over b. So this is 0. And you have for the delta, and, you know, we could say approximately, because we are doing Taylor series expansion here. This is 1 half h squared over b. And the one on the other side is 1 half h prime squared over a. That's on the other side here you know, where you have here the uh, A case, you know, and this is the A, you play the same game. And also for the small angles, the H's are pretty much going to be the same. So we take the H approximately equal to H prime, and then for the big delta, which is the sum of the little ones, you're going to simply have one half, I'll say h squared over two, one over a plus one over b. Add these two together, there's your one half out in front, there's your h squared since the h and h prime are the same, and you have one over a plus one over b. That's the optical path of the difference. Now for for Fraunhofer diffraction, by considering the uh, aperture having a plane wave, then basically, if you have a plane wave, you know, that the curvature is gone. Then when you go from the source, R prime, and then you come over to here, like this to R, And this angle is very, very small. A agrees with R prime, B agrees with there, and they're like delta zero. So let's look at this and compare with the wavelength to see what's going on. Because for that delta to appear to be zero, you really want it to be compared to the wavelength of light. That compared to the wavelength of light, you know, crests and troughs, basically, that delta is 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 zero. So if we look at a diffraction grating, for example, a diffraction grating can have 250 little slits, 250 lines per millimeter. So that means the distance between them, 1 over 250, which would be this, by the way, is a thousand microns, which sometimes you can just write like that. 
microns or micron. Also, you can like put the liter on there, mic microliter if you want. So that would be four microns if I write it out. But the slits are smaller. We could say that the slit width is of, on the order of one microliter. So if that means we're looking at this distance, this distance here, the slit to be one micrometer. But remember that when you're doing this curve here and you're doing this, this is your H. When we did that H, for example, yeah, this is the H here. Say the H, there's the H. So the H is basically your, your slit width. So if you do that, then in this formula, you're going to have, say here, this is going to get you a 10 to the minus 6, that's the uh, micron, and that's going to be squared over 2. And then here, well, if you pick some, some distances, like let's say A is equal to there's some source about 20 centimeters away from the slit and say b is like 100 centimeters like in the lab about a meter away these are reasonable setup parameters so this would be if a is 20 that's one fifth of the meter and this is b is one meter so you're looking here this five is going to flip over. This is five plus one. I'm taking one half of that. So you're going to have a three. But see, when you square this 10 to the minus six, you get 10 to the minus 12. I mean, that is really, really small. And that's on the, say, the meters there. And if you wanted to go to nanometers, remember, uh, nanometers, you would go here with three times 10 to the minus 3. I'm splitting this up. So you have 10 to the minus 3 times 10 to the minus 9 to get your 10 to the minus 12. And see, this is going to be your nano. So you're looking here at 3 times 10 to the minus 3 nanometers. Wow, that's 3, like over a 1,000 nanometers well that's a lot less than say visible light middle of the spectrum somewhere like where we're most sensitive to light is that 550 nanometers that's very very small so that's your Fraunhofer diffraction or Fraunhofer far field so we have then the far field which would be Fraunhofer and then what we're going to be studying in the next few classes here, the near field, it's going to be Fresnel. And if you get real close to the source, that would mean you have the slit like this and there's some source back here. And then you're going to be like right there. You're in the face. You then get blinded by the light. So, in other words, the extreme near field in your face. I'm just going to say blinding light. So, you're not going to get, like, lights and darks. You're going to get blasted by all the light. Then when you back away, you'll have the diffraction effects. So, now we go, we go to the book now for a school diagram where you're looking at the spherical wave, the mother wave here, and we're looking at concentric regions so that when you look at the extra path length, you add wavelength over two. So that means you're gonna get destructive interference with adjacent regions 
And if you skip one, then you'll have constructives. Because if you go by a wavelength, you're in good shape. If you go by, you know, half a wavelength, you shift a crest over to a trough. This is shifting by half a wavelength. So this is the way it's set up, the Fresnel zones. And this extra path formula, which we derive, we're going to set that equal to, to get the zones, m times lambda over 2. Since we were adding, remember, for the r, you basically are taking, you know, earlier we called that a, and we called that b. So you take the, the b, and you add that delta. Well, that delta is over here, and if we set it up this way, where you're going to tack on an extra distance of lambda over 2, then you have this formula m, lambda over 2, and you can think of the m as being 1, 2, 3, you know, to get the various places. So this, this first circle here, if you go up to the top, the beginning of a zone, that's your lambda over 2 extra. If you go up to the next beginning, that's going to be 2 lambda over 2, 3 lambda over 2, and so on. This is in our book. This is the master formula we already derived. I showed you where it came from. And this one here is one we already set up also. The only thing we're doing here is we're replacing h by the radius. Since h was that measure in the up direction. So we're basically letting the, the H be the radius. And then we're using a little M on there because we have different ones for like different sizes. So the A becomes Z prime, the B becomes Z. So this is our adapted our formulas. So they're the two things. Now for this small radii. Now I'm using capital R, you know, for the radii, you know, going away from the center here. Okay, so these are the equations we had before. And if I make the approximation that the R prime and Z prime are roughly the same, R and Z, because this distance is very close to this distance, then I can replace R prime with Z prime R with Z and pull pull it out of the equation as a constant. Look at that. So EP is equal to the integral over the aperture, E naught. This is our equation we had earlier. And the approximation here, r prime, is going to be like the z prime. r is going to be like the z. Now we make that approximation down here in the denominator, but we're very careful up in the top here not to do that because of the cosines and sines. See, this, this is large. You can get away with that, but you don't want to mess around if you're doing cosines and sines because of the oscillations. So for the angle being small, this becomes a 1. And we get for the point here, E naught over Z, Z prime, integral E to the I, K, R prime plus R, da so that's our formula now now if you want to consider one of the zones like just pick one then for one of the zones there's going to be you know some big r in the radius and you're going to have this setup where on this side you have, this is going to be our Z prime, this is our Z. So if you go up there, this is going to be an R prime to get up there. 
this is going to be an R to get back down. So you got yourself here two triangles. You're going to have, you know, you're taking, this is the R prime here, hypotenuse, hypotenuse. So R prime plus R, these are two hypotenuses. So you're going to have Z prime squared plus big R squared to get this, this one. So this is the R prime, this one here. And then we're going to add to get the other one. Since that's what appears up in here, that's what I'm interested in. This is the big R squared plus the Z squared. Okay, so you have to be careful up in here. So then we can write down R prime plus R. We could pull out the Z prime. And if we do that, we'll have a big R squared over the Z prime squared, the one half power. Pop that Z prime in, goes in as a square. There it is. Squares cancel there and you get the R squared. And do the same thing here. You're gonna get one plus R squared over Z squared, the one half power. Now, this R is definitely small, big R, compared to the Z and Z prime. So now we can do the expansion and have one plus one half R squared over Z prime squared. And then this is going to be Z one plus one half R squared over Z squared. Then we can uh, kick the Z's back in. And that's going to get you a Z prime. And this is going to get you a Z. We'll go ahead and write these out first. And then we're going to have R squared, big R squared over 2. And we're going to have 1 over Z prime plus 1 over Z. So let's check this. Z prime, that's this one here. Z, that's that one there. When you bring the Z prime in, one of the Z prime squared, you're going to kill one of the Z primes there. So you'll have the one half, capital R squared, and you'll have the one over Z prime. Have the same thing over here going on and pull out that common R squared over two and so you get this formula. Very nice. But now we notice something that this part here, remember when that was our H over H squared over two, and this was our, you know, the A and the B. This is the extra path length. That's what that is. That's very nice that it showed up like that. So that means we can write E to the I, K, R prime plus R as E to the I, K, Z prime plus Z plus the delta. Beautiful how that showed up like that. All right. This is what we had earlier, just to show it. Look, here it is. Where we did that. So your H is your radius. Here's your two, and the A is a Z prime. The B is the, the Z. That's it. All right. And then we can let that R be like different ones, and have the subscript on there like we we did earlier. So this means that if we go back to our formula EP, here's the formula here. So we're going to look at E naught over Z, Z prime, and then the integral that we're going to have here is going to be E, this E to I K, this sum here, we're going to write that as I K, z prime plus z and just pull out this delta part i k delta da so we have that cool formula we just simply put this back in here is what we did so we have the stuff out in front out in front and then putting that in there 
and just separating out the delta part since the exponents add, when you multiply, you have this equation. Now notice that this is a constant. This is beautiful physics here to see all this. This is an E naught over Z, Z prime, E to the I, K, Z prime plus Z. And now, just over the aperture, you have E to the I, K, delta, real cute formula there, the A. And then from before, you know, this delta, we can put a little subscript M on there, and then we would have an R squared to the, the nth case over two, and then we would have the same one over Z prime plus one over Z in there. And remember that when we do this, we're just reminding everyone this is M lambda over two, because every time you go to one of this, concentric rings you're adding you know m for the basically like the edge is going to have m lambda over two like we saw earlier we can define this to be one over l capital l and we can even combine them z prime z add them up common denominator you get this uh, z cancels First piece is 1 over z prime. Then when you have this, this will cancel. You have 1 over z. That's nice. All right. So the L is equal to z prime z. We're flipping this over z plus z prime. So let's look at this more carefully. If we do this and use this substitution, then this is going to be a nice compact formula, delta of m is going to be the r m squared over 2, and this is 1 over l, using our definition, it cleans it up a bit, and that's m lambda over 2. So this means that the radius of the uh, Fresnel zone is going to be equal to the 2's cancel, the L goes over here, so you have this cool formula, M lambda L. And then if you want the radius, you would take the square root of M lambda L. Nice. Now, if you want the area, you have pi r squared. So pi r squared, and let's look at the M plus 1 concentric ring minus to find a concentric ring, you have to subtract. In other words, you have to go, you have to take the radius out to here and find that area. Then you're going to find the radius out to there, find that area. And then we're going to subtract them. So this will get me the area of the ring, which is one of the zones. So using the formula here, this would be, if I square this thing, put the pi in front, and I have m plus 1, this is m plus 1 lambda l, and then this other one has the pi, just square this thing, get the same thing here, that's under that radical sign. And notice that the m parts are going to cancel, and you're going to get here pi, pi times... lambda l. But now lambda l, when m is equal to 1, you get lambda l. That's like the first case. So in other words, this is the first case. So this is like the first zone. But this is a very, very interesting effect. It's showing that all the concentric rings are constant, like it's the same area, same area, because r1 is fixed. Isn't that, isn't that wild? So that's a very, very nice effect. Now, if you look at, say, this formula here, you could solve for M, and that will tell you here, if you take this radius, general radius squared, and divide by lambda L, 
this will tell you what zone you have. And that's uh, sometimes referred to as the Fresnel number. You basically take an R squared, some like general R squared of your choice, and just divide by lambda L to see what you get. All right. And that is the Fresnel number. Let's write that down. Fresnel number. And let's like plug in some numbers and check it out. Suppose you had capital R is one centimeter, just to plug in some numbers. And say the Z prime and Z in the laboratory, oh, let's say they're 10 centimeters, you know, 10 centimeters, you know, the Z prime's over here, 10 centimeters to the left. The Z's on the other side, 10 centimeters on the other side. You know, it's, it's close, close range, say, there. And then say that the lambda is, let's just pick somewhere in the middle of the spectrum, 500 nanometers. Then the first thing to do is to find that L. But remember, that L is given by product over sum. So if we use this formula, L, the product of the Z's over the sum, since they're both 10, you have 10 times 10 over 10 plus 10, which is 100 over 20, which is 5. So this L is 5 centimeters. We said the R was 1 centimeter. So that means for the Fresnel number, you would have for the 1 centimeter, 10 to the minus 2. And that has to be squared. And then you would divide by the 500 times 10 to the minus 9th times here 5 times 10 to the minus 2. Because the 5 centimeters is going to go there. The wavelength is going here at your nanometers, 10 to the minus 9. And the 1 centimeter is up in the top. So this is going to be equal to up top 10 to the minus 4. And then you're going to have 5 times 500 is 2,500. And you're going to have 10 to the minus 11. So we'll make this, this is 10 to the minus 4, we'll make this down here 25. So it's 10 to the minus 9. You know, put the two, two zeros going there, knocks minus 11 down to minus 9. And that's going to be equal to 1 over 25. Now you subtract the exponents here, you're going to have 10 to the 5th. So you have a minus 4, minus a minus 9, so it's 9 minus 4. And that's going to be equal to 100,000 over 25. If you just look at this part, 25 goes into 104 times, so that'll be 4,000. Wow, that's a big number, huh? See, those wavelengths are small, so... So you take a centimeter or something, wavelengths are small, you can get a lot of Fresnel zones in there. What is the radius for the central Fresnel zone by using the formula? M is 1, so you're going to have the square root of lambda times L. All right, that's what you're going to have for that. So if you do that, we're going to have here, this is the square root. Uh, 500 times 10 to the minus 9th. And the L was 5 centimeters, so that's 5 times 10 to the minus 2. So that's going to be the square root of your 2500 times 10 to the minus 11, which is the square root of 250 times 10 to the minus and by kicking one of those zeros, multiplying in, you get that minus 11 times the minus 10. And here, you know, this is very, very close. The, if you're doing two significant figures, this will work. 256 is going to work. And then when you take uh, 
the square root of that 10 to the minus 10, you get 10 to the minus fifth, like five, like that. And the square root here, this is 16. That's why I did that. So if you have 16 times 10 to the minus five, uh, that's like saying 0.16 times 10 to the minus three. So that is 0.16 millimeters. Interesting. Larger than we might have originally thought. You know, point, almost 0.2 millimeters. So let's go back to that Fresnel number again. That Fresnel number is R squared over lambda times L. If we look at a diffraction gradient, a modern diffraction gradient now can have 100 lines easily per millimeter. So if that's the case, then your distance here is going to be approximately, this is one line per micrometer. Because if you take the one millimeter and divide by a thousand, that's what you're going to get. So we're trying to get a, a feeling for the size of the slit that's in a diffraction gradient. So you got a thousand of them per millimeter, then each one's going to be one micrometer. So if I just plug that into the formula for the Fresnel zone, uh, the Fresnel number, rather. I plugged it into the formula to get the Fresnel number. This is 10 to the minus 6 squared. And I have here 500 times 10 to the minus 9th. And I have here a 1, 1 meter. So this is 1 fifth. 10 to the minus 12th up here. Down here is 10 to the minus uh, 7 when I kick two of those zeros in on that 10 to the minus 9th. And just to get some numbers, get a feel for this Fresnel number here for diffraction gradient, you got here 10 to the minus 5. You know, minus 12, minus and minus 7, so minus 12 plus 7 gets you at minus 5. And I just wanted to show you that this is very much less than 1, that the Fresnel number is very much less than 1 when we're talking like the fraction grading, which we did for Fraunhofer. When we were doing Fraunhofer um, analysis, we were analyzing the diffraction grading. So if we just plug in some numbers from like our diffraction grading problem, you're seeing the Fresnel number is a lot less than one. And that's consistent here by saying that the uh, R squared over the L is a lot less, is a lot less than that wavelength. And that's similar to what we saw earlier, since this r squared over l, the r squared over the r squared over l, remember, is related to your delta. It's the r squared over l, so that's saying that the optical path difference, see, a lot less than lambda for diffraction gradients, Fraunhofer around. That just confirms what we already know. U four. The unobstructed wave. So here, if you look at those Fresnel zones, you're going to have, like the first one, say E1, and then the next one's going to have a minus sign. So we're going back to here, that... At this point P, if you have the uh, amplitude due to the first case, see this zone here, a zone there, a zone there, they're going to they're going to be alternating in terms of lambda over two, lambda, lambda over two, constructive and destructive kind of interference. So there'd be a phase change plus E3, minus E4, and so on. But then if you group these, make this E1 over 2, and then here, say plus E1 over 2, minus E2, plus E3 over 2, and then group this one, E3 over 2, minus E4, 
plus e5 over 2, like this. Still got the same thing. Got an e1 minus e2 plus e3 minus e4. But see, this is the amplitude due to that second zone. And this is like the, this is taking an average of the neighbors. And that's going to be close to zero. That the one here is going to be like E2 is going to be like close to the average of the two neighbor ones. So this is zero. So the effect is going to be E1 over E2. We say unobstructed because now we have no obstacle. Like we're just looking at the whole thing. All right. So if we do that, we can consider this as the unobstructed wave. So for the unobstructed wave, remember the irradiance is always one half times the amplitude squared, or you have to take the uh, magnitude of the complex number and then square that. So this is one four times one half and just write in the one this is going to be one over eight. I just want to write it like this because what this is showing you what this is showing you is that this here would be the effect of the first zone. And what we're saying is that the irradiance here for the unobstructed wave is the same as 25% of the effect due to the first zone. Let's look at the phasor diagram, sometimes called the vibration curve, in conjunction with the Fresnel zones. Now the first Fresnel zone is the one that has radius R1, that's the circle here in the middle, and the top of it is where you have the lambda over 2 at a phase the point. And that begins the second Fresnel zone, which goes from lambda over 2 to 2 lambda over 2. Now, you can think of this Fresnel zone as consisting of subsections, where the key here is when you get to the edge of the zone, you're at a phase, so that's here, pointing to the left. And if you start down at the middle here, you can think of a vector down here pointing to the right. And then as you go up, 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 up to the edge, you, you have these little vectors that are going eventually to go point west. And then the total effect of that first zone is E1 that goes from the bottom to the top since you just add up all these vectors. You're starting down there and you end up up here, you have E1. Then when you go from the beginning of the second zone to the end of the second zone, you're going from pointing west to back at the end here is where it's going to be lambda. That's in phase pointing east down here. And because the vectors are getting smaller, you're getting farther and farther away from the center, you come back here a little bit above you know where you started so then to go from the top down to there is the strength of the second zone and notice it's basically out of phase with the first zone and then for the third zone you would start here you're pointing east and then when you get out of phase you're going to be pointing west so that's the end of the third zone. So the third zone goes from the bottom here up to there. And you are essentially adding all these vectors up. And you're going to wind up in the center. And this is the result of the unobstructed wave where all the zones contribute to the point P. You get the strength. Notice that this is one half the strength of the first zone by itself. So that means that if you looked at the first zone by itself, if you were to block out all the zones by having an aperture, then you would have something that's twice as long and four times as bright when you do the square. And then if you were to look at, say, blocking the first zone, 
so you don't have this, then here's your total when you had everything. If you knock out E1, you take this vector and subtract E1 from it, and you'll be pointing south the same, uh, the same length. So that means uh, the total here minus this one is going to be pointing down. Half uh, the size of E1, same strength, which means that by blocking E1, you're going to have a vector that's equivalent to the length of unobstruction, which means you're back to being uh, here the unobstructed case. So the unobstructed case is this one here. So that means you're going to see a spot. You'll see a spot behind the obstacle. However, when you move this point P, these uh, lengths and Fresnel zones change, and then you can get a dark spot. It could alternate. But this helps to understand the phasers in terms of the Fresnel zones and how it all works together very nicely. So the unobstructed wave, then by definition, no obstacles, is going to be one eighth times E1, the length of E1 squared. And you can write that as a vector form, that EP as a vector, is equal to the E1 over 2. You can make it as a vector. U5, the circular aperture. For the circular aperture, and we're going to stay on the axis here, because we've been analyzing things on the axis. That's what we've been, we've been looking at things, you know, over here on the axis. So if we look at this, we see that what we're going to do here is have a, an aperture and we're going to say block all zones but the first. Well, if you do that and the first one comes through, then EP will equal E1, like full blast, like, like all the other zones are gone. So if that's the case, then when you do your irradiance, for this case, you'll get one half the E1 squared. But wait a minute. We said E0 was one eighth E1 squared. So when you block all the zones, this is going to be four times brighter. That's going to be four times brighter. So that's like an opening there. That's just the first zones coming through. But then if your aperture were a little larger, so two zones come in. Well, remember that next zone has that lambda over two optical path difference. That's going to kill things off. So that's fascinating that you can get here like two effects depending on the size of your, your opening, you go from having a spot in the middle to having a dark thing in the middle. And also you get the similar effect if you move your point around because when you move your point around, the Fresnel zones have like different sizes and you can, you can get the similar effect as you move, move around. Here's a great diffraction video that shows this in operation as we go from the very, very close near field where we're blasted by the light into the Fresnel zone that have the changes and now into the Fraunhofer zone. And that's uh, here, Villa Miser, David Velasco, Villa Miser.
Now we go to the circular obstacle. And if we have the obstacle, let's place the disc so the obstacle here blocks out inner zones, but there's outer zones that are still going to get to the point over here and have interesting effects. So if you were, for example, to just block zone one, well then the, the point here, you would have so we had all the zones, you had this, E1 over, over 2. So you can think of the first zone being E1, and all the other zones subtract it in E1 over 2, and that's what you got. So this is zone 1, and these are all the other zones subtracted, because we know that this is what we get when we have all the zones. We already worked that out. But now if you block out E1, you get the same thing. In other words, EP is then just minus E1 over 2. You get the same thing. Just has a phase change, but then when you do your square to get your radians, that minus sign is going to go away. So now this is amazing because this is saying that you can get a bright spot right behind the obstacle. Now, historically, this idea of waves and interference was new. Thomas Young did an experiment in 1801. And here, this is the effect if you have white light, how the interference pattern occurs. We already analyze this problem in detail. And we got, you know, this formula here. And Thomas Young can be thought of as the beginning here of the taking the wave idea seriously amazing a person, a physician, a medical doctor, and a physicist, spoke many languages, several languages, and did work on the Rosetta Stone, which had been discovered by Napoleon's army in 1799, and years later when he became interested after he, around 1814, and he virtually unlocked the key to understanding uh, the the most difficult of the languages because they had this Rosetta Stone had like different languages. The hieroglyphic portion was the one that had the, the most serious challenge. So there's this competition set up. We have some powerful judges. We have Laplace, Bayat, Bayat from Bayat and Savart fame. We have Poisson, Gay Lussac, the uh, chemist and physicist, and Arago, the these are all French, and he's the chair of the committee. And they invited articles on light, and Fresnel submits. And Fresnel submits a paper on the stuff we're talking about here, the wave aspects of light. And Laplace, Baya, and Poisson don't believe in waves. They believe in the particles. And Poisson doesn't like the paper, he believes the paper is wrong. So he uses the paper to show what we just did, that there is a white, there's a, could be a spot behind the obstacle. And he says, this is ridiculous. You can't have, you can't have a spot behind a shadow. So he's ready to like, you know, vote him down. But Arago, the chair, not so fast, actually sets up an experiment to check it out and finds the spot. And the spot is now called the Poisson spot or the Arago spot or the Fresnel spot. Poisson, in other words, trying to knock down the model, to prove that Fresnel's equations don't make any sense, actually helped verify the model. So Poisson was not happy with that. Um, he had to admit he was wrong because of science. Okay, and here you have it. Um, there's the Poisson spot, a little spot, and here's more, a simulation uh, where you have a spot in the middle. This is with a 633 nanometer helium-neon laser 
one meter behind the disc with the disc diameter of four millimeters, two millimeters, and one millimeter. Very nice.